I'd like to uh, talk about something a little bit different today in the sense that this material is not uh, intrinsically magnetic, but uh, under applied bias, we can generate a type of effective magnetization that manifests as a very large nonlinear type of anomalous Hall effect. Okay, so this work um, was primarily done by my student, uh, Archana Tawari, with some help from Joey Jong. And uh, it, was, it wouldn't be possible without the very nice crystals grown by my postdoc, Feng Chu Chen, when he was still a graduate student at USTC in uh, Professor uh, Yu Ping Sun's group. And we also had help from uh, various theorists, uh, uh, Bing Haiyan's group from Weizmann and Tian Yil's group from UT Austin, and uh, Professor uh, Liu and Zhao's group from the University of Michigan helped us to do optical second harmonic generation to characterize the crystalline orientation of our samples, of our small flakes. Okay, so let me just start at the very beginning so that everyone's on the same page. So these days, I think we take the Hall effect for granted, uh, but uh, it was quite, uh, you know, it was, it was quite interesting that Hall discovered this so long ago. Um, of course, we know when he passes a current in a non-magnetic conductor, uh, under applied magnetic field, then a transverse voltage or electric field develops. Okay, and nowadays we know that this is just a manifestation of, uh, you know, the, the, the Lorentz force, but uh, he discovered this actually many years before Lorentz actually formulated that, uh, that law, so it's quite interesting. And one way that we can gauge the strength of this effect is to define a you know, Hall angle or Hall ratio, essentially taking the ratio of the generated field, the transverse field over the field that we apply. Okay, so this is defined somewhat differently depending on the literature. Sometimes it's field over current. Sometimes you see a tangent of this thing, but for simplicity, you know, I'm just gonna define it this way, call it a Hall angle or ratio. And, um, you know, unsurprisingly, it's proportional to the magnetic field that you apply. So it was actually the same Hall who discovered the anomalous Hall effect a few years afterwards. So he simply replaced this conductor here with a magnetic conductor such as iron. And he saw that the effect was uh, substantially enhanced. And not only that, uh, it, it became nonlinear. Okay, so uh, it's nonlinear with magnetic field. And these days we know that that's just because the field is magnetizing the sample. Okay, and so in principle now when you even turn the field off, as long as the sample remains magnetized, then we can get um, some Hall effect, some anomalous Hall effect. Okay, and we can also quantify the strength of this effect by looking at the Hall angle, except now, because this effect persists even in the zero field limit, this allows us to basically characterize the strength of the material itself. Okay, and typically this ratio is rather small in uh, traditional uh, materials, traditional magnets, it's about 0 0.01. And then when you get to something like 0 0.1, then I think that's considered a giant anomalous, or sorry, a, a giant anomalous Hall effect. Okay, so it's tempting to think of the reason why this happens as basically the magnet generating some internal field um, in your sample. Uh, but it turns out that's actually not correct. Okay, so there are generally two type two reasons why the anomalous Hall effect manifests. One is coming from the intrinsic band structure of the material, and the other is coming from extrinsic scattering mechanisms. Okay, so I'll tell you about that uh, one by one because there's actually a strong connection between the regular anomalous Hall effect and the nonlinear anomalous Hall effect that I'll talk about. Okay, so the intrinsic part is probably the easiest to understand nowadays because we understand more about the topological aspects of band structure. And we know that there's an important quantity called the uh, Berry curvature. And it is that Berry curvature that gives us a velocity contribution of the electrons, not only parallel to the field that we apply, the electric field, right? That's the ordinary you know, current, but also a field, a velocity contribution perpendicular to the electric field. And that's exactly what gives rise to a Hall effect. And so we can define a current, right? Which is just the integral over the velocity weighted by the distribution function. 
And in particular, we can look at the transverse component of, uh, of, of our current, and that's the, uh, not, uh, that's, the, uh, that's the Hall current, okay? And the proportionality constant between that transverse current and the applied field, that's the anomalous Hall conductivity, right? And unsurprisingly, it involves the Berry curvature somehow. Right, so we can ask, you know, under what circumstances would we expect to see an anomalous Hall effect? And of course, it doesn't happen just in any material, okay? And that's because that if the material has time reversal symmetry, then this uh, Berry curvature is an odd function in momentum. And also, if we're looking at equilibrium conditions, then this uh, distribution function is an even function of momentum. Okay, so I know I've drawn this uh, Fermi sphere here shifted by a little bit, but in general, that shift is rather small. And so we can think of this as being a symmetric function. Okay, so I'm integrating a, a odd function with a multiplied by an even function, and I get zero. All right, so we have to break one of these things. Um, and typically what we do, of course, is we break time reversal symmetry because we're looking at magnetic system, right? Uh, but that's not the only way that we can get a anomalous Hall effect. There are also extrinsic scattering mechanisms. And generally, there we can think of two types. One is what's called skew scattering, which looks like this. And another is side jump, which looks like this. Okay, so I know it's not very obvious just by looking at these pictures, but qualitatively, without going into the microscopics, you know, skew scattering, the spins separate after the collision, okay, and they continue to separate, whereas in side jump, they only basically separate during the collision process, okay? And as such, we can apply certain scaling laws, okay? So in the limit of zero temperature, the um, skew scattering contribution should scale linearly with the transport lifetime, okay? And you can kind of already see this in this picture, the longer the scattering time between scattering events, then the further these spins can separate, okay? Whereas for side jump, it scales as t to the zero, so it doesn't depend on the lifetime. And for comparison, the Berry curvature contribution, because it's an intrinsic uh, property of the band structure, it also doesn't depend on lifetime. All right, so we can kind of take these as, you know, operational definitions for these different scattering types. And uh, furthermore, already you can see that it's not quite so easy to distinguish between side jump and Berry curvature just by looking at uh, the, the, the uh, scaling alone, right? Because they both don't depend on the lifetime. Okay, so in 2015, it was realized that uh, perhaps there's another way to get uh, an anomalous Hall effect uh, without breaking time reversal symmetry, okay? So Sodomen and Fu at MIT uh, had this paper in, uh, you know, in, in the PRL, and they titled this uh, nonlinear Hall effect in time reversal invariant materials. Okay, so I think another way to call this is a nonlinear anomalous Hall effect. And their key inspiration, at least according to my interpretation, is that they said, hey, what if instead of breaking time reversal symmetry, what if we just drive the system very hard so that it's no longer in equilibrium? Okay, so essentially this Fermi sphere is just shifted very far out to the right, let's say, and then this no longer is symmetric. And so then, you know, this anomalous Hall is not forced to vanish. This anomalous Hall conductivity is not, not forced to vanish. Okay, but this is a nonlinear effect because you have to really drive this thing, right, with, with electric field. And so in the limit of zero electric field, then the anomalous Hall conductivity is still zero. And so that's different than the regular anomalous Hall effect, right, which doesn't have that constraint. And so to see this more explicitly, it's probably easier to look in the frequency domain. So if I apply a oscillating electric field of frequency omega, that nonlinearity would generate a sum component at frequency two omega. So I get a Hall current at two omega, as well as a difference frequency. But you know, let's focus on the sum frequency here. And um, the strength of this effect, while it's not you know, it doesn't make too much sense to talk about the anomalous Hall conductivity anymore. It makes more sense to talk about a susceptibility, right, which is the proportionality constant between this Hall current and the square of this electric field, okay? And when they calculate for the uh, susceptibility, at least the intrinsic part, um, it still depends on the Berry curvature, but it's not the Berry curvature by itself. Now it's the derivative of the Berry curvature which they call the Berry curvature dipole. 
All right. But still, you know, it, it, you know, this thing doesn't just happen in any, any ordinary material. So if we agree that we want to retain time reversal symmetry, if the system also has inversion symmetry, okay, then, you know, an odd function, an even function, they have to be both at the same time. Therefore, the Berry curvature has to vanish across your Breland zone. And when there's no Berry curvature, again, you don't get any nonlinear Hall effect either. Okay. So what we have to do is we have to break inversion symmetry um, while still retaining time reversal symmetry. So we're not going to look at magnetic systems. So more specifically then, how do we go about finding some materials that, uh, that have this effect? Okay, so here it, it helps to recognize a connection with a, uh, an optical effect uh, called second harmonic generation. Okay, so there we know that when we input a photon of frequency omega into a nonlinear medium, we can get out photons of frequency two omega, right? Um, and, you know, if you look at the susceptibility here that governs this process, it looks very similar to the susceptibility here, right? Of course, the units are different, uh, but the symmetries are exactly the same, right? Uh, it's just usually in, in, non, in, in second harmonic generation in optics, you're dealing with optical frequencies, whereas here, you know, we're talking about electrical frequencies. But the symmetries of the crystal don't care about what frequency you're probing in that, right? So they, they're, they're governed by the same uh, symmetries of the crystal. And that means we can basically open up our favorite nonlinear optics textbook here. I've opened up Yariv on my bookshelf, okay, which gives you essentially the susceptibility, um, the nonlinear susceptibility, depending on the point group symmetry, okay. And of course, you see here that it's he says that uh, you know if the for centrosymmetric systems that retain inversion symmetry, the susceptibility is zero. Okay, and that's consistent with that, with what I just mentioned before. Okay, so I know this is an old textbook, so it's not quite easy to see, but basically the big black dots correspond to elements that are non-zero, and the small black dots correspond to elements that are zero. And so, you know, we can go find, you know, elements that are non-zero and try to measure that, right? So uh, the, Two symmetry, the, the two uh, point groups that are going to be relevant for us are class M and class MM2. Okay, and I'll show this in more detail. Okay, so the material, the family that we're going to look at is uh, MOT2 slash WT2. Okay, um, they exist in the same family, and they're actually two different crystal structures that are very close together in energy. Okay, 1T prime and TD. The only difference is that the uh, unit cell is slightly rotated. Okay, um, right. So this is monoclinic, this is orthorhombic. All right, and um, these energies are rather close together. And so basically by changing the temperature, you can go from one to the other. So the low temperature state for both materials is the TD phase. That's the one that actually breaks inversion symmetry. So that's the one that we care about. If you raise the temperature, then you can get into the 1T prime phase. And uh, that structural transition for WT2 turns out to be quite high in temperature. So, you know, for all, for, for practicality, then we can basically take WT2 to be in the TD phase all the time, okay? All right, so I'm gonna skip this. So let me tell you more about the symmetry properties of this TD phase of either one of these two materials, okay? So there is a mirror plane symmetry that's perpendicular to the A-axis. Um, and this is going to be for the bulk crystal, okay? So there's a glide plane symmetry that's perpendicular to the B-axis. So that means I flip, and then I also have to translate along the C-axis. There's also a screw axis symmetry that's parallel to the C-axis. So that means I rotate about the C-axis and then translate about the C-axis. Okay, so this is true in bulk samples. However, in thin samples, Basically, anything that involves a translation along the c-axis, that symmetry is lost just because, you know, we're dealing with a few layers. Okay, so thin samples actually have lower symmetry than uh, the bulk sample. And as such, they have two different point groups, uh, mm2 and m. Okay, so if we look up these susceptibility tensors, they look like this for mm2. Okay, I have various non-zero elements, and those are the ones that are going to give rise to my Hall effect. And in particular, if I apply a, an electric field in the in plane, okay, along the A or B axis, then I get a single Hall current along the C axis of my sample, okay, that's given here. 
Okay, in contrast, for thin samples, I have more elements that are non-zero, and I end up getting nonlinear currents in basically all, all directions. Okay, and in particular, for you know, there are currents that are in-plane as well, and these are actually anisotropic. So if I apply an electric field along the A-axis only, I get a Hall current along the B-axis, but if I apply an electric field along the B-axis only, I do not get a Hall current along the A-axis, okay? And so these two are anisotropic. And these in-plane Hall effects were actually measured quite recently uh, in WT2 by uh, Pablo Harillo Herrero's group at MIT and also by Kinfai Mac and Jishan's group at Cornell. And so in, in Pablo's data, what they see is that they're biasing at a harmonic current omega, and they're going to look at the Hall voltage to omega, and you can see that it scales nonlinearly with the current that you apply. Okay, so uh, this group actually went, did something a little bit different. They, they made a, a device where they can inject current along different directions of the crystal, uh, basically almost continuously as a function of angle, and they've also linearized this plot, okay? So they're plotting it as a function of the harmonic voltage, the longitudinal voltage squared, okay? So the second harmonic versus the first harmonic longitudinal voltage squared. And in this plot, basically this would linearize Pablo's data, okay? And they see that um, if I apply, if they apply current at 90 degrees or 270 degrees, that's along the A-axis, they get a rather large effect. Okay, but at 180 degrees, they're applying it along the B-axis, and they pretty much get no effect, and that's consistent with the symmetries that I showed you earlier. Okay, so the lesson here, their conclusion was that in bilayer WT2, as probed by Pablo's group, the uh, mechanism is mainly coming from the intrinsic part, the Berry curvature dipole, whereas in uh, Kinfai Max and Ji Shan's group, it was both the Berry curvature dipole and skew, skew scattering. And the size of this effect, well, that would just be governed by the susceptibility, right? However, experimentally, no one is probing for Hall currents. We're always probing for, you know, voltages or electric fields. So really, that means we have to look at this electric field here, right? And so experimentally, the strength of this effect can be taken as the Hall field at 2 omega divided by the longitudinal field at omega squared, okay? And that's basically susceptibility divided by the conductivity, okay? And so the size of this effect is something on the order of nanometers per volt, okay? And we can remember this number because I'm going to come back to it later. So at this point for us, this was our starting point and we thought this was very interesting, but then we noticed that, hey, no one has actually probed for this C-axis anomalous Hall effect, right? And this is something that we thought could be also interesting. So we wanted to come up with an experiment to probe for the C-axis Hall effect. And so which material should we use? Uh, well, fortunately, there is a prediction by Bing Haiyan's group that calculated the intrinsic component for these two materials. And they looked at, compared WT2 and MOT2, and they saw that basically MOT2 has an order of magnitude larger Berry curvature dipole than WT2. So we thought, why don't we start with MOT2? Okay, so this is the geometry that Archna made. Um, so we're also, we also have a circular geometry that allows us to inject current along different axes of the sample, but the, 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 the Hall voltage or Hall current that we want to probe at the end of the day is the C-axis one. So we designed contacts to probe, uh, a set of vertical contacts to probe for this. Okay, and Archna used boron nitride basically to block off for these vertical contacts, everything except the very tip. So we're not mixing in the signals coming from the, you know, in-plane components. Okay, and here's an optical image, which is not too clear if you don't really know what you're looking at, but basically a schematic is, uh, that's the measurement schematic. Okay, let me skip this. All right, so I have this schematic here as a reference. So this is just to show you the type of measurement that we're typically doing. We're injecting current at frequency omega, and we're going to measure the longitudinal voltage at that same frequency, okay? And this, the slope here just gives us the resistance, right? And it's linear as we expect, but the second harmonic C-axis com component is nonlinear. Okay, and so just like uh, what Kinfai Mac and Ji Shen have done, I'm going to linearize this plot for conciseness 
and I'm going to plot that second harmonic versus the squared of that longitudinal first harmonic. So now basically I can read off the strength of these effects by looking at the slope. And you can see that, uh, you know, along the, for current along the A-axis, the strength is a lot larger than current along the B-axis. Uh, in thick and thin samples, although the symmetry group is different. So we wanted, um, uh, we wanted to see uh, how this would change as a function of thickness. Okay, so here to compare everything equally, uh, we're not gonna look at the voltages, we're going to actually look at the electric field values. Okay, that just normalizes the dimensions out. And then we can see that basically as we decrease the thickness, um, this effect become smaller and smaller. However, the A-axis is always larger than the B-axis, right? Yeah. Adam, just a quick thing. Uh, the last slide and the half of the last slide, you may have been frozen. You may want to repeat uh, the last, uh, yeah, the right uh, graph. Okay, uh, which sorry about that. Again, thank you. Yeah, so basically we've also measured the in-plane, um, the in-plane Hall effects, okay? And basically it, it's, the signal is very small in comparison. Okay, and that's actually consistent with the symmetries I talked about earlier. So this means that we're gonna focus on the, the C-axis. Okay, so this effect decreases with de decre decreasing thickness, but it's always larger for along the A-axis. And so why is this? Well, we can compare with the, um, well, before I compare, I should mention that the largest um, strength that we see is something on the order of 0.56 meters per volt. And so this is actually about nine orders of magnitude larger than uh, the in-plane measurements in WT2, okay, which is why um, I'm calling this a, a rather large or giant effect. Okay. And um, so if we look at the resi residual conductivity, it, it shows that it follows the same pattern, okay? Decreasing with decreasing thickness, and then also the uh, A axis is always larger than the B axis. So it seems that this, you know, the size of this nonlinear Hall effect just follows the conductivity, right? And we can be more sure if we just take the same sample and then measure as a function of temperature, okay? So with increasing temperature, the conductivity decreases and also this, this nonlinear Hall effect also decreases, okay? So it seems like everything is just dependent on the conductivity of the sample. And so we have basically four samples of different thicknesses and two crystalline axes. We can get eight, eight, um, we can get eight scalings with temperature and hopefully we can see something that's, uh, that makes sense. Okay, so I should also point out um, for reasons which become clear, and if, if we can also look at the resistivity instead of the uh, conductivity, and here basically below about uh, TL, about 20 Kelvin, it starts to saturate. Um, just, you know, as you go from phonon to impurity dominated scatter. Okay, so I'm going to, we're going to take all of our data and look at the strength of this effect as a function of the conductivity of the sample. Okay, and we've normalized this to the residual conductivity. And so basically the, this conductivity here, that's just obtained by changing the temperature, right? And indeed, you kind of see a, a universal scaling Tend to, uh, tend to emerge, right? So I'm plotting this in a log-log scale. So a linear plot on this scale is basically a power law. All right, so at higher temperatures, you see that pretty much all of these follow um, a, a squared dependence on conductivity. Okay, below a certain temperature, then it starts to increase even further. And where is this crossover happening? Well, if we actually measure the local slope, okay, as a function of temperature, and we plot everything out, okay, and we normalize it to the TLs, the separate TLs for, for each of the samples, each of the axes, we see that that crossover happens essentially around TL, okay? So higher than TL, that slope is pretty much two, okay? Uh, that power law is pretty much two, and then below TL, it just starts to rise continuously. Okay, so we want to try to understand this effect, 
And fortunately, there's a strong connection here with the anomalous Hall effect, the regular anomalous Hall effect. And this might be coincidental, but the strength of this nonlinear anomalous Hall effect, if I just write it out in this way, it turns out that this strength scales exactly as the linear anomalous Hall effect conductivity would scale. Okay, so there's a you know, this, when I write this out, there is a nonlinear anomalous Hall conductivity in the numerator that does not scale with the anomalous Hall conductivity in the linear anomalous Hall effect. Okay. Because one is nonlinear, one is linear. But if I divide this by the linear conductivity, coincidentally, it actually scales as the linear anomalous Hall conductivity. Okay. So we can dig into that literature and figure out what people have learned about this scaling. Okay, so as I, you know, what I told you before was at zero temperature. When I change temperature, things are actually a little bit more complicated. Okay, so the Berry curvature contribution is still constant, okay, because that's an intrinsic uh, band structure property. It doesn't scale with the conductivity. For skew scattering, okay, it scales as the temperature dependent conductivity squared, okay, divided by the residual conductivity. Um, and then side jump is the, the most uh, annoying one in a sense, because it has scalings that depend on uh, all three. Okay, so there's a constant term, there's a linear term, there's a squared term. So a priori, just by looking at the, these scalings, you know, because the side jump has the same as skew scattering and, and, and Berry curvature, we, we can't just tell a priori what, what this is coming from. But it's generally understood that for really high, highly conducting samples, the skew scattering contribution should be dominant. Okay, and without going into the details, this is kind of consistent with that lifetime argument that I gave earlier. Okay, and as I will show, you know, our samples are actually very, very conducting. Okay, so for the high temperature part, we're going to scale this with a sigma squared plus b. And we're going to assign the big A to be coming from skew scattering, which means that it should depend on some parameter alpha, which is called the skew scattering coefficient, divided by the residual conductivity. Okay, and so if I plot A for all of our samples, for all of our axes, blue is the B axis, red is the A axis, you see that it decreases with, um, it decreases with increasing residual conductivity. Okay, and that's consistent with, with this thing here. And so alpha, if we try to calculate it, turns out to be, you know, this value. It's very difficult to compare with the linear anomalous uh, Hall effect because the units are completely different. But this is about five orders of magnitude larger than um, what uh, the, the, the in-plane measurements for WT2 in Kinfai Mac and Jishan's paper. And so this probably contributes to why this thing is larger. Okay, the constant term, remember, contains both intrinsic and side jump contributions. Um, and so we can't disentangle them a priori, but we know from uh, Bing Haiyan's calculations that the uh, intrinsic contribution should be down here. Okay, and so what this means is that this is most likely all extrinsic. Okay, and the intrinsic contribution is rather low. So below TL, that's where things get a little bit more complicated. I don't want to go too much into it because there's actually no theory that deals with this sort of dependence. We can extract, you know, an exponential dependence on the conductivity, which you can kind of already see here. Um, okay, so we can do that to quantify it, but I don't want to talk about it because there's nothing really to compare it to. Okay, so um, I just want to show two more things. Um, so I know that the Hall angle is not the fundamental quantity here because it's a nonlinear effect, but because of this nonlinearity, that it's actually quite nice if you want to achieve very large Hall angles. Okay, and that's because this, um, you know, the basically this uh, li this linear voltage, the longitudinal voltage, scales linearly with the applied current, right? But the nonlinear Hall effect, uh, the nonlinear Hall voltage, scales quadratically, right? And so at some point you know, this would exceed this. And in principle, you know, we'd be able to achieve infinitely large, you know, Hall angle. And so we wanted to see what kind of a Hall angle we could achieve, okay? So Archna drove this device to very high biases. Um, and here is the, this nonlinear signal. This is the linear signal. And you can see at low bias, the linear signal is indeed linear. But of course, at some point, probably the device starts to heat up. So this nonlinear, this linear, linear, 
um, electric field, the, lon uh, the linear electric field begins to show some nonlinearity as well. Okay, but below that point, the Hall angle rises, rises quite dramatically, okay, and it reaches its peak here, and that peak value is about 2.83. Okay, so as far as I know, I think this is the largest um, Hall angle or ratio, however you want to define it, outside of the, um, uh, the quantum Hall regime. Okay, another quantity that's important is the, this nonlinear anomalous Hall conductivity, which depends on this Hall angle and also the C-axis conductivity. Okay, so it turns out that no one has actually measured the C-axis conductivity for MOT2. Um, and so we actually pleaded with our collaborators to do so. So first, uh, Bing Haiyan uh, calculated, his group calculated this conductivity. So even though this is a layered structure, um, the, the, um, the, the electronic structure is actually quite three-dimensional. Okay, so the C-axis conductivity is not too much lower than the um, in-plane conductivity. And um, our measurements uh, by our collaborators more or less co collaborate this thing. Okay, so you know, 0.25, this is about, you know, 0.6. So it's all in the same ballpark. And when we take this anisotropy and we put it in here to get the anomalous Hall conductivity, we get something on the order of 10 to the eight uh, Siemens per meter. Okay, and if we compare this value with the um, linear anomalous Hall materials, uh, again, this is quite large. Okay, so some of the giant anomalous Hall compounds are, are, are down here. Okay, and overall, you see that if I go to, if I have larger residual conductivity, then I also get a larger uh, anomalous Hall conductivity, right? That's the overall trend. And as I, you know, told you before, our samples are very conducting. So this, again, should mean that skew scattering, it does make sense to assign that uh, squared part to uh, skew scattering. Okay, so um, as far as I know, this is the, the, the highest that has been measured. But the huge caveat here is that this is a nonlinear effect whereas these are mostly linear effects, although we plotted the, some of the other nonlinear materials down here. So I think I've probably used up um, a lot of my time, um, and I will just end by thanking uh, the people that did this work one more time, as well as uh, you for your attention. Thank you.